Today on Beerus TV, we're going to share our most detailed video on calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. Hey guys, my name is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the BRS 160, where every week we do our best to help you guys, members of the reefing community, enjoy your tanks and find new ways to explore the hobby. We do that by following the setup and progression of this 160 gallon reef tank. In today's episode, we're gonna cover all the main aspects related to calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium, starting with how a deeper understanding of these elements really revolutionized reefing, the role of each in the reef tank, the desired levels for our reef tanks, and a brief overview of the different methods of maintaining calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. Reefing in general and the type of corals that we can maintain in our tanks has come a long way in the last couple decades. There have been some advancements in filtration and lighting that have helped, but arguably nothing has advanced the hobby as much as the understanding of calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium and the variety of methods of maintaining these elements proliferating the knowledge set of the average reefer. It wasn't that long ago that while experienced reefers had a good handle on this, the average reefer was just handed a container of super duper calcium, a container of alkalinity buffer deluxe, and just told that you should add some to the tank because it's good for the corals. The packaging more or less said add a teaspoon now and then without explaining what you're trying to achieve or how to know if you have. Most people will just quit using the buffer or additives because it doesn't seem like it's doing much or worth the effort. Luckily those days are in the past and there's a plethora of resources, refined products, and sources of knowledge that explains everything that you need to know about why we maintain these elements and how they're truly the difference between an awesome thriving reef tank and a slowly dwindling one. Beyond that, testing methods have got better and the advent of reefing calculators out there have revolutionized how we add these things. Rather than read the packaging and add a teaspoon of Calcium Super Deluxe every full moon, you can enter your tank's calcium level, what do you want it to be, and it'll tell you exactly how much calcium to add. You can test in 10 minutes and confirm it worked. It's an incredibly satisfying experience. When you maintain these proper calcium and alkalinity levels, you'll absolutely see way more coral growth and everything will be visibly healthier. Basically, this all boils down to two things that are very closely related. Every day the corals consume elements from the water like calcium and alkalinity. If we want these corals to stay healthy, we have to replace these elements. Not only so there's a continuous source of these elements for their health and growth, but also so the water chemistry is stable. At its most basic level, it looks like this. Corals, coralline algae, and other tank inhabitants have a skeletal structure made out of a substance known as calcium carbonate. Most of you have seen a dead coral, so you know exactly what calcium carbonate looks like. Corals and coralline algae create the structure by pulling calcium ions and components of alkalinity called carbonate ions from the water to create that calcium carbonate skeletal structure. It's not exactly the same, but at its most basic level, it's similar to how your body utilizes calcium to create your own bone structure. There obviously needs to be adequate calcium in the foods you consume for that to happen. In this case, the coral needs adequate concentrations in the surrounding water. If you don't replace what the coral uses, don't be surprised when the coral doesn't grow or even dies slowly from the stress of living in an unnatural and inadequate environment. Right behind that is the effects on overall water chemistry. When the corals consume these things in a closed environment, like an aquarium, they change the chemistry, reduce stability, and stress corals out, which makes them more susceptible to other potential issues, which not only stuns growth, but also increases mortality. The biggest example of how the chemistry changes is related to alkalinity and pH. There's a very close relationship between the two. As the alkalinity drops, so does the pH and acidity of the tank. As the corals grow, they're going to pull carbonate from the water, reduce total alkalinity, and in most cases drop the pH as well, which means as the corals consume the carbonate, they're not only reducing the amount of carbonate in the water for future growth, they're also acidifying the water and dropping the pH, which has a whole slew of potential negative results. It's important to replace this carbonate as it's used. We're about to dive a bit deeper into all this, but if there's only one thing that you take away from today's video, it's this. Don't eat LPS and SPS corals and coralline algae consume calcium ions and components of alkalinity called carbon ions to build their skeletal structure. If you want your corals to stay healthy and grow and maintain an awesome reef tank, you absolutely need to replace calcium and carbonate ions. If you refuse to do this, don't be surprised when your tank suffers because of it. As we take a closer look at each of these elements, calcium is probably the easiest of the bunch to understand because other than availability of the corals for biological function, there isn't a big impact on overall chemistry as it gets depleted. So it is important to maintain calcium levels to make sure there's calcium ions available to the corals, but that's pretty 
pretty much the only concern in relation to calcium. Calcium is one of the two basic components corals need to make their calcium carbonate skeletons and one of the most abundant ions in natural seawater. Calcium concentrations in the ocean vary depending on the area and salinity, but often reference in the 410 to 420 range, and this is what most reefers maintain in their reef tanks. I will say some go higher or lower with a range of about 380 to 450. There isn't a lot of data that shows any significant benefit going higher or lower than natural seawater. So my advice is attempt to emulate the ocean with 420 parts per million. One important component to this is you do have to have realistic expectations for hobby grade test kit accuracy as well as user error performing the test. Tiny mistakes with measurements or determining the end point of the test can easily result in variances of 10 to 30 points. Rather than get hung up on this, it's easier just to select something safe in the middle and that reinforces the 410 to 420 range that most reefers shoot for. Because calcium is so abundant in seawater, it's also one of the easier elements to maintain in the reef tank. This is where alkalinity comes in. Alkalinity isn't as abundant in the reef tank and correspondingly the levels drop much faster. Your corals could consume 50% of the total alkalinity in the water and the calcium levels might only drop from 420 to 400 or 390. So while both are important, it's absolutely more important to keep a closer eye on alkalinity levels and replacement than calcium. Alkalinity also isn't as straightforward as calcium. While calcium is a measurement of the calcium ions in the water, alkalinity in the reef tank is basically a measurement of anything in the tank that's capable of buffering acid in the tank and closely related to maintaining pH is appropriate for the reef tank and the resulting tank chemistry. There are a whole slew of things in the reef tank that can buffer acid, but the lion's share by a magnitude of over 95% is typically bicarbonate and carbonate to a lesser degree elements like borate, which make up just a few percent in most reef tanks. The difference between carbonate and bicarbonate is carbonate is a carbon attached to three oxygens, and bicarbonate is the same thing with the addition of a hydrogen. Bicarbonate represents somewhere in the neighborhood of 90% of the alkalinity in the average reef tank, and carbonate closer to 5%. While bicarbonate will always make up most of the total alkalinity, how much is bicarbonate or carbonate is closely tied to the acidity of the water or pH. At higher pH, as more and more of it becomes carbonate, it's very possible that there might be three times as much carbonate at a pH of 8.3 than there is at 7.8. This is where the suggested pH of 8.3 for reef tanks come in. Well, you can have a healthy tank anywhere in the range of 7.8 to 8.3. It's very likely that your corals will calcify and grow faster closer to 8.3. This is also where it gets a bit heavy and where pH, alkalinity, carbonate, and bicarbonate all intersect in terms of what's happening with calcification, the coral skeleton, and growth. It's actually the bicarbonate your corals are combining with calcium to create calcium carbonate and form their skeletal structure. As the corals utilize the bicarbonate, they free the hydrogen from it to utilize the leftover carbonate. They then need to free themselves of that acidic hydrogen. It's much easier to free themselves of the hydrogen when the surrounding water has a higher pH and presumably a larger volume of carbonate willing to take it on. Net result is higher pHs in the tank up to about 8.3 promote easier biological function and increase faster calcification. So the last piece of alkalinity is understanding testing because most of the alkalinity in the reef tank is just bicarbonate and carbonate. When we're measuring alkalinity, it's a fair assumption that what you're really measuring is just the amount of bicarbonate and carbonate in the water. So end of the day, when somebody says corals use calcium and alkalinity to calcify and grow, you know what they're really saying is corals are utilizing calcium and a component of alkalinity known as bicarbonate to form calcium carbonate to calcify and grow. And when they say they're testing alkalinity, what they really mean is they're testing for the amount of carbonate and bicarbonate available in the water. Because the reefing community doesn't like to make things easy, there's also three measurement terms commonly used for alkalinity with calcium carbonate equivalents, which is probably the least common term, mill equivalents or MEQ per liter, which is used by most US U.S. scientists and a good portion of the reef hobby, and then DKH or KH, which is a German term for alkalinity. For whatever reason, DKH is probably the most common term used in reefing and what we refer to because of that. Well, it varies on location. A DKH of 7 is a pretty typical measurement of ocean alkalinity. The levels maintained in reef tanks vary widely between 7 and 10 or more. There have been a few studies that show corals calcify faster at alkalinities near 10, which promotes reefers to push the limits. There are also a lot of reefers who believe emulating ocean values at seven is best. 
Well, no one can definitively say what is best. I can say I've seen all kinds of tanks successful anywhere in that range. And I'm going to give the same advice I did for calcium. Shoot for the middle at around 8.5, which gives you some buffer for testing and dosing inaccuracies. On to magnesium, which is the last major ion in the water we'll cover today. Magnesium has a very different role in the reef tank, but just as important. Before we get too far into that, there's one important thing to understand. Not only can corals combine calcium and forms of carbonate together to form calcium carbonate, but this thing can happen right in the tank's water as well. More or less, there's 420 parts of calcium per million floating around in the tank. When they just happen to collide with a carbon in the water, there's potential for it to form calcium carbonate all on its own. This new calcium carbonate crystal is now highly attracted to new calcium and carbonate ions. Left alone to continue this process, the calcium and alkalinity levels in the tank would rapidly fall as all these calcium carbonate crystals grow and consume most of the calcium and alkalinity in the tank. This is where magnesium comes in. Magnesium is a similar ion to calcium and it can attach itself to the surface of the calcium carbonate crystal floating around the tank, which makes it much less attractive to new calcium and carbonate ions, keeping them free for corals to utilize for calcification and growth. For this reason, it's critical that you maintain proper magnesium levels. If you don't, it'll be very difficult to maintain proper calcium and alkalinity levels. One of the main reasons magnesium is so effective at preventing precipitation in the tank is because because magnesiums typically triple the levels of calcium at around 1250 to 1350. Again, right in the middle of that range at 1300 is probably a good number to shoot for, but I'd say most reefers, including myself, maintain 1350 just to keep precipitation at bay. Okay, so if you were new to all this, it was a lot to take up in a single sitting. If you don't understand every last piece of it, it's okay. All you really need to know is a healthy reef tank has calcium levels around 420, and alkalinity at a DKH of about 8.5, and magnesium around 1300. In the upcoming three weeks, we're going to give you a complete picture of the three main ways of adding calcium and carbonate to the tank with two part, which is just a jug of calcium and a jug of alkalinity or carbonate you pour into the tank. Super easy. We'll also cover Kalkwasser, which is a unique additive, which adds calcium and alkalinity in a single product. And in addition to that, one of the best methods of maintaining a higher pH in the tank. Lastly, we'll cover calcium reactors, which are one of the coolest gadgets in reefing. Calcium reactors actually use carbon dioxide to melt old coral skeleton or other sources of calcium carbonate into calcium and carbonate ions, which can be dosed to the tank. Biggest benefit is presumably a very natural source of trace elements. That's everything we have for today, so I hope you were able to pick up something new on calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. If you did, give us a quick thumbs up and subscribe. This one's a bit complex, so don't be afraid to ask questions in the comments area down below in the community, or we will do our best to clear things up. See you next week with episode 30 of the BRS 160, everything you wanted to know about Kalkwasser.